If you're following all of our videos in order, then by this point, we've talked a little bit about certain routing protocols. And some of them are link state routing protocols. Some are distance vector routing protocols. And there's also a category of hybrid routing protocols. But what does this really mean? Let's step through each one of these different categories and get an understanding of what each of these routing protocols really uses to determine how to get information from one place to the other. Link state routing protocols are most interested in the quality of the link between point A and point B. And it makes its routing decisions based on those particular vectors. At the most basic level, if the link is there and available, it sends the traffic down that connection. Obviously, if the link is not available and you can't get there, it doesn't become part of the routing table. But there's more to link state routing protocols than just connectivity. We can also look at bandwidth. We can look at delay. We can understand the quality of that particular link. And if it's a faster connection, these types of routing protocols often have ways to send traffic down the faster link, even though it may be a farther distance away, for instance. If you look at large networks, they use these types of scalable routing protocols to be able to send this traffic. And these routing protocols make the determination of where it should go based on a number of these very important link metrics. We often see this in protocols like OSPF or ISIS. These are very very large types of routing protocols used in very big enterprise networks. And the reason that they're used is because these link state routing protocols give you so much flexibility at being able to set up and route information through your network exactly the way you'd like. If your routing vector is based on distance, then your router is going to be most concerned about how many hops it takes to finally get to that destination network. A distance vector routing protocol then is keeping a table of where all of those networks are, and it knows exactly how many hops it is between its router and where the final destination might be. So when it's trying to calculate, should it send packets out that particular interface or that particular interface, it's going to make a determination of which way is shorter. And it determines that shortness based on how many hops away. This is usually an automatic process. There's very little configuration you have to do, but simply say, use that routing protocol, and it builds the table itself. Obviously, there are limitations here, because just because something may be a farther number of hops away doesn't mean that it's a less desired route. It may be a faster route than a route that is a fewer number of hops away just because the bandwidth might be different or the, the network itself may be having response time problems. We would hope our network protocols would be able to understand that. But if you're using a distance vector routing protocol, then obviously it has no way to make that determination. It only looks at the number of hops and makes its determination of where to send traffic solely based on that. If you have a relatively small network and there are uniform link speeds going between different locations. You don't have a lot of variability. Perhaps the network doesn't have a lot of multiple sites to get to where it needs to go. So you don't have as many hops, then perhaps distance vector is a good solution for you. If you have a larger network, though, then you need a little bit more control, a little more ability to tell the traffic to go down a particular pipe than another, then perhaps this isn't the best routing protocol for you. But one of the advantages here is that almost everything is automatic. It's very dynamic. You simply turn it on, and the distance vector takes care of everything else. A good example of this is if you have routing information protocol or RIP v2. Perhaps you're running something like BGP. Those are very much focused on how many hops it takes to get down the line to the next location. And if you're running those, it's simply turning on some of those capabilities and having the dynamic aspects of that protocol handle all of that routing for you. Like the name sounds, a hybrid routing protocol is a little bit of distance vector. It's a little bit of link state. You sort of blend a lot of those things together to come up with something that takes into account many different metrics in order to make its decisions. A good example of this is EIGRP, the Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol. It is a Cisco proprietary protocol, but the fact that it is a hybrid protocol means that it's taking into account a lot of different metrics. It's looking at bandwidth, at load, at delay, at reliability, at the maximum transmission unit, and the hop count. So all of these different metrics, and you can see some are related to distance vector, like hop count. Some are related to link state, like the bandwidth and the load and the delay. It combines all of these things together into an algorithm that it then calculates to determine 
if it should send traffic down one connection or down another connection to get to that final location. So by combining a lot of these things together, Cisco feels that they have a protocol that works well in many different situations. The disadvantage, of course, is that it is Cisco proprietary. So you'll have to have Cisco technology on both ends to be able to use this type of routing protocol. The disadvantage, of course, is this is a Cisco proprietary protocol. And if everything you have in your network is Cisco related, then EIGRP would probably work fine. But if you have other manufacturers' routers, they're not going to understand this EIGRP. And you'll need to choose one of the other routing protocols that everybody's able to talk to each other.